Hello, I'm Pastor John Rickard of Our Redeemer Lutheran Church in Newark, Delaware. This past Sunday was January 12, 2020, the first Sunday after Epiphany, also known as the commemoration or festival of the baptism of our Lord. The lections were Isaiah 42, 1 through 9, Psalm 29, Romans 6, 1 through 11, Matthew 3, 13 through 17. The sermon is titled Baptism, and the text is Romans 6, 3. The sermon was read by the leader of our worship committee because I was on vacation. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's text is taken from our reading out of Romans. I read again verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Here ends the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Today is the first Sunday after the Epiphany. Epiphany was this past Monday, and we celebrated it last Sunday. The big focus of Epiphany is the revelation that the human being, Jesus, is at the same time the divine Son of the Father. It would have taken no great theologian to gaze at the baby Jesus and identify him as human. However, you must have spiritual eyes to see that that small child is also Almighty God in the flesh. In a Christmas Day sermon given by St. Augustine, this mystery was wonderfully explored. He said, The one who holds the world in being was lying in a manger. He was simultaneously speechless infant and word. The heaven cannot contain him. A woman carried him in her bosom. She was ruling our ruler, carrying the one in whom we are, suckling our bread. A O oh, manifest infirmity and wondrous humility, in which was thus concealed total divinity. Omnipotence was ruling the mother of whom infancy was depending, our nourishing on the truth of the mother whose breast was it was suckling. May he bring his gifts to perfection in us, since he did not shrink from making his own our tiny being. And may he make us into children of God, since for our sake he was willing to be made a child of man. The baptism of our Lord is recounted in our gospel lesson every first Sunday after the Epiphany, because the divine nature of Jesus was manifest that day when the divine Father identified Jesus as his beloved Son, in whom he is well pleased. The Father's Son is not an honorary title, nor is it a title Jesus earned. It is recognition of who he is by nature. It is recognition that at his conception, he was already divine and human. This is a recognition that what the angel told Mary was perfect truth. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. If we can reshape Augustine's words, we can say then, he, he into whom we are baptized is himself baptized. He who needs no repentance receives a baptism of repentance. He who places life in the waters of baptism raised from the waters of life. He whose life was joined with what we are joined with in the waters of baptism, is joined to his own life. He whose death we are joined with in the waters of baptism is joined to his own death. He whose resurrection we are joined with in baptism is joined to his own resurrection. He whose ascension we are joined with in baptism is joined to his own ascension. <clears throat> he who is re whose return we are joined with in our baptism is joined to his own return through the same waters. On this day, the waters of baptism are filled with grace, a grace that reached backward, giving all the baptism of John their forgiving power, 
and reached forward, giving the same grace to all baptisms performed in the name of the triune God. Because of this, today is also often used to celebrate the great gift, the wondrous sacrament of baptism. Baptism is a miracle. Sometimes people ask, do you believe in miracles? They usually mean something like healing a person of a physical ailment without the aid of modern medicine or medical intervention. We can always answer, yes, I believe in miracles. Of course, sometimes our Lord does in intervene and grant a physical healing modern medicine cannot explain, but not always. Nonetheless, we can always say we believe in miracles because every Christian baptism is a miracle. Every time we receive the Lord's true body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins, we are witnessing a miracle. Every time someone is brought to faith in Christ, we are witnessing a miracle. Yes, we believe in miracles, and the most sure miracles are the ones our Lord tells us about. Let us take a moment to ponder the miracle of baptism, the very sacrament Jesus received and we heard about in our Gospel reading. As we receive this miracle, the very same words the Father spoke concerning Jesus are then spoken by the Father concerning us. Baptism is a point of controversy in today's church. Some flatly deny that it is a miracle. It is described as an outward work signifying a decision the recipient has made. It is thought of as something like the little sticker you are given after you vote that says, I voted, and an outward symbol of what you have done. Thus, baptism is taken from the biblical category of gospel and placed in the category of law. It is no longer thought of something God does for us, but rather a good work we do for God. Such a view ignores all that the Bible teaches, reinterpreting it according to what human reason can grasp. Today we shall review just a few of the plain words of the Bible concerning baptism and let God speak for himself. We will start with our reading from Romans, which says, What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Let us stop here. Paul is introducing our life of sanctification which is based on the spiritual reality that we have died to sin. So if our ability to live as Christians is tied to his death, one must ask, when did this happen? We immediately get the answer. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul does not say we were baptized into a symbol of his death, but into his death. Therefore, the death we die is found in Christian baptism. We are united to Christ as he hung on the cross and said, It is finished. But we are not united <coughs> with our Lord's uh, atoning death when we are baptized. But we are not just united with our Lord's death uh, when we were baptized. Therefore, Paul goes on and says, has, and tells us that God says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Again, there is no hint that this is only a symbol. We are told that this is actually what happens through the waters of baptism. We are actually raised to life with Jesus. The power of God that raised Jesus is the same power of God that raises us in baptism. When St. Paul writes about our new man, or new Adam, or new life, baptism is always behind his thinking. As Christ is the second Adam, so our new Adam is born when we are joined to him in baptism. Again, notice that there is no vocabulary here that suggests this is only a symbol. It is something that God is doing in fact. So the Holy Spirit goes on through Paul and says, We know that our old self was crucified with him through baptism 
in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, because the body of sin was killed in the waters of baptism, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Here, sin is conceived of as our former master. Our baptism death severs that relationship. Even in the physical world, when a slave dies, his former master has no more ability to control him or force him to do his bidding. In baptism, we are separated from our former master and united to our new master, Jesus. So Paul goes on to write, <clears throat> For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will be also alive with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, to die, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> that last verse, verse 11, is often lifted out of context and made a good work we must do by gritting our teeth, teeth and bringing all our will power to bear so that we can consider ourselves dead. However, in context, we see that Paul is encouraging us to consider our baptism by which we died to sin and were made alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is more than simply having Jesus as a model. It is Jesus as our life. In our baptism, the perfect life of Jesus was born in us. We step forth from the grave with Jesus in our baptism. Death no longer has dominion over him, and therefore it, it no longer has dominion over us. Our life of sanctification, our good work, is a gift Christ gives through baptism and is continuing grace given in those waters. Again, we should notice that there is no hint that this passage is to be understood symbolically. Paul is recording what actually happens in baptism. Let us now hear a few other words about baptism, which are also blunt and not symbolic. In Acts 22, Paul is recalling his, converse, his conversion. He remembers Ananias saying to him, And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. As Peter wraps up his Pentecost Day sermon, he urges his hearers, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Comparing baptism to the flood, Peter reminds his readers that baptism does now also save us. Paul tells the Colossians, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Because of passages like these, what Paul wrote to the Ephesians makes perfect sense. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Not only is this a great passage confirming the Trinity, but it reminds us that we have only one baptism. This is so because Jesus died only once, and our baptism unites us to his one death. Many more passages could easily be added, but we lack time for that. Again, let me say that not once, but in all passages, does God let me say again that not once, but in all passages, does God suggest baptism is only an outward symbol reflecting some inward reality. The waters of baptism do have symbolic value, just as the bread and wine in communion have symbolic value. But that symbolism is secondary. The substance of baptism, and for that matter communion, is Jesus. Both connect us to our Lord who saves us. So, on this day, when we remember our incarnate Lord who received baptism, we rejoice that he is creating the waters that join us to him, to his life, his death, his resurrection, and his return. This is a gift only Almighty God can give, and he has given it to us. 
Let us rejoice then, not only in the baptism of Jesus, but also our baptism, through which we have been granted such an abundant life in Jesus. Amen. May our baptismal blessings keep us steadfast in our Lord unto life everlasting. Amen.